seen the righteous man forsaken. We trust you, Jesus. We trust you. You are here. 
Only you, Jesus. Nobody greater in all the earth. We sing Lamb of God, anointed one who was and is and is to come. You're seated on the throne above. You're holy, holy, righteous one who shed his blood. You prove to us the Father's love. Jesus Christ, be lifted up. You're holy. Can we declare that tonight? Say, Lamb of God, anointed one who was and is and is. song of praise to him tonight tell him how much he means to us God you're the only one who matters tonight Jesus this is for you this is all for you Jesus there is no one and who else is worthy who else is worthy to him tonight. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I could search. I could search for all eternity. Yeah. There is none like you. There is no 
I'm like you And there is none
says that the government will be upon his shoulders and to the increase of his kingdom government and peace there will be no end I thought about it just for a moment it didn't say a individual government or even governments plural but government as an entire construct will be upon his shoulders and it will be such an easy lift for him that it will create room for unlimited increase as it pertains to his kingdom. And I thought about this, anything that you allow the Lord to carry, even though it may burden you, it doesn't burden him. And that's why he says, come to me all who are heavy laden and burdened and watch, and I will give you rest because there is nothing that you will ever offload on his shoulders that he won't have the capacity to carry. Because here's what happens in the presence of God. It's like all of a sudden, if you've ever tried to like lift uh, like an object in water, something heavy, it gets thrown in. If you allow it to sink all the way to the to bottom of the the floor of a pool it, it becomes difficult to lift but if you can catch that thing while it's still floating in that in between something that would have been impossible for you to lift outside of that environment now feels almost weightless because the buoyancy of the water is making up and counting against the weight of the object and I just think like when you get in the presence of God things that you thought you could never carry, never deal with, never process, never get healing from, never recover from, all of a sudden, when they get on his shoulders, you recognize it's not as scary as I thought, not as difficult as I thought, not as impossible as I thought. If I'll just allow him to carry what his shoulders were designed to carry, then in turn, I'll be able to carry what my shoulders were designed to carry. In his presence, that which seems insurmountable, the heavy lift of the day, the week, 
the month, the year, your life, your family system, your mental health, the stresses, the pressures of everything that you have come out of are going through or potentially heading towards. You get in the presence of God and all of a sudden he becomes, watch, the lifter of our heavy heads. Because his presence, it, it almost creates this weightless environment where the normal operational rules all of a sudden cease to exist because in his presence, the lift becomes light. And you've got to know this evening, it's so funny to me because I experienced this too. I can be like dealing with pain or processing something difficult or worried or anxious about Easter next week or paying for a Kirkland building or planting another campus or dealing with an issue or problem that we have. And it's like, it can literally be like 559 in the green room. And I'm like, oh man, what are we going to, oh man. I'm sweating bullets and trying to figure out. And all of a sudden I get into the sanctuary and the presence of the Lord is here. And it's like that which was weighing me down now seems to almost not exist. And, and Paul says it this way. He says, keeping your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Watch, laying aside the weight and the sin which so easily ensnares. And you've, you've got to know tonight that in his presence, man, it's a great opportunity for you to offload the weight and the heaviness and the how is this situation going to be resolved or be able to be figured out and just for a moment allow the one whose shoulders are broad enough to uphold every government at once to care for your issue tonight for if it does not escape him when the sparrow falls from the tree are you not more valuable than them which means if it's on your heart tonight, it's on his. And I would just encourage you like in this moment, like release to God what you were never designed to carry. Because get this, when you've got a bunch of heaviness on your shoulders, a bunch of weights piling up on your back that you were never designed to carry, guess what doesn't fit on your shoulders? The coat of many colors that represents your dreams, the mantle that God desires for you to carry, his cloak, his covering, his grace. When your life is so filled up and packed heavy with all of the stuff that you refuse to release to him because I've got to be in control and I've got to figure it out. And like, you know, the older I get, the more I realize actually how little I'm in control of. <laughs> On any given day, stuff happens that is so bizarre and wildly outside of my capacity to understand or control. If I don't learn the sacred art of offloading my burdens onto the shoulders of the one who was designed to carry them, then I'll live life weighed down by stuff that truly doesn't even belong to me. It belongs to him. And in the brilliant story written so many years ago called Pilgrim's Progress, it beautifully illustrated the bondage, the baggage, and, and the heaviness of an individual who is far from God, but he's on a progressive journey headed towards the cross. And when he gets there, there is this beautiful exchange of laying down what his soul can no longer contain and instead receiving the rest that Christ offers us. In the book of Hebrews, the apostle Paul speaks in Hebrews 4 about how Jesus has become our Sabbath and all who enter in through him will have rest for their souls. And can I tell you, friend, your, your soul, it, 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 it's not just about your soul being temporarily medicated tonight by his presence. It's about your soul shifting into a place of rest because you're making the decision by your own volition, I'm going to trust God with that which I can't control. I'm going to trust God with that which I can't carry. And when you trust God with the burdens and the weariness of your life, it's incredible how much capacity opens up in your heart. 
All of a sudden, you've got time to care for that other person who came on Sunday night. All of a sudden, you've got enough strength, energy to prophesy over that person who needs it tonight. All of a sudden, you find yourself not just as poor me, I hope somebody can pay attention to me, but now you're looking to serve somebody else at their point of view. Why? Because for the first time in a long time, you've got capacity in your heart again. And if you'll trust God to carry what you can't, I can promise you this, you're going to even like physically walk out of this place today feeling like, I don't know if I've stood up this straight or tall in like the past six months, man, what's going on? There's a burden that's been lifted off. You, you, you see it sometimes on people's face when people come out of bondage. You can literally see it on their face. Their countenance changes. And this is scriptural. This ain't pseudoscience. All over scripture, when people encounter the glory of God, what happens? Their countenance changes. Remember when Moses is hidden in the cleft of the rock and the glory of the Lord passes in front of him and his face so shines and radiates with the glory of the Lord, he has to veil it so that the Hebrew children don't in turn worship him. <laughs> and now with unveiled faces, we see him and he shares his glory with us. And we come into the freedom that is only found by placing your trust and fidelity in the person of Christ Jesus. And as his glory passes in front of us tonight through worship, through the word, through prayer, I would encourage you, allow what you see to change how you look. Did you hear me? Allow what you see to change how you look. Because when glory passes in front of you, it's for the express purpose of the lifting up of your countenance. Why are you weary and downcast? Oh, my soul, <laughs> I will forget not the benefits of the Lord. And when you get in an environment of faith and an environment of glory, man, it'll change you and transform you from glory unto even greater glory. God, tonight we offer you the things that we were never designed to carry. We enter into the supernatural rest that only you can provide. We offload the burdens of yesteryear. We offload the burdens of how we were raised and the things that we walked through and the experiences that we have and the unanswered questions that await us in the days ahead. The worries, the fears, the hopes, the dreams, the desires, all packaged into one existential human experience. God, we trust it with you tonight because you are the one who is familiar with our suffering and our sorrow. And if anyone knows what to do with the burdens I have, it's you. So God, tonight we exchange that and in doing so we receive that countenance of glory. We receive the lifting up of our heavy head. We receive freedom from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet. We receive that anointing that abides, that breaks off the yoke of bondage. We receive in exchange for our heaviness, <clears throat> the yoke and the burden, which is easy and light from the Lord. And God, today, I pray that as <clears throat> we worship you and the beauty of your majesty, as we go to the scriptures and allow your word to transform our lives, that tonight, like even through the preaching of the word, I pray that your hand would come upon people and all of a sudden things would just begin to lift and dissipate. Like literally, like I see it, I, I really see it in my spirit tonight. Literally, like trauma, drama, and weight that you've carried. And, and for some of you, it's like, it started off as a good thing. You were trying to bear somebody else's burden, but pretty soon it became too heavy for you and it actually became part of your identity. And you don't know how to operate without being overburdened by somebody else's stuff. And the Lord tonight is gonna bring healing to your soul. The balm that flows from Gilead is gonna medicate and minister to your soul tonight. And I'm just telling you, through worship, through the word, through prayer, you're gonna feel it and it's gonna like lift off of you. And some of you, you're gonna even have like an emotional reaction. You're going to have tears come to your eyes. All of a sudden, it's gonna be a gratitude that comes to your heart. It's gonna be like you're taking a breath in for the first time in a long time because oxygen, like hope, is coming back to your soul. And I just believe tonight that God is still in the business of saying, lift your eyes.
valleys to the hills for whence your help comes from your help comes from the Lord but you can't lift your eyes to the hills when your head is hung low and burdened over with the affairs of life but if you would offload the weight and sin which so easily ensnares God would lift your eyes he would change your perspective he would change the way that you look he would show you his glory he would share with you his supernatural rest because Sabbath isn't an event that you mark off on your calendar Christ has become the Sabbath rest for all of those who believe and all who put their faith in the Lord and their hope in the Lord will not be set to disappointment but instead we'll see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living so God tonight we trust you we break agreement with burdens that were never ours to carry we break agreement with the identity of heaviness we break agreement with exhaustion we break agreement with tiredness and lethargy and apathy in Jesus name I break heaviness off your life I break depression off of your life I break stress and anxiety off of your life I break dark suicidal thoughts off of your life I break self-harm off of your life I break low self-esteem and low self-value off of your life you are everything that God says you are and you ain't and he says that you're not and he says come to me and I will give you rest <laughs> it's like the women who go to the tomb on resurrection Sunday mistaking Jesus for the gardener saying if you just tell us where you've laid his body we'll go carry it and Jesus when he finally reveals himself to the women who have gathered at the garden tomb it's like he's saying this is the last time that you'll have to carry me I'm carrying you my spirit's gonna carry you my presence is going to carry you. You can offload the burden and the fear of where did Jesus go? Did he really just die in front of us and is this the end? No, you can, you can trust me, Mary. You can trust me, Martha. I'm now here to, to carry you. And so, God, tonight we receive from the throne room of heaven. We say do your best work in, in our lives. And God, we, we invite you into the places of weariness and we invite you into the places of exhaustion. We, we invite you into the places of tiredness and, and we invite you into the places of anxiety and fear. And even though it's uncomfortable because we don't normally like opening those doors in the mansion of our heart, we invite you in that you would take your rightful seat and rearrange the dynamic and the environment of our interior until we look like you. I thank you that this world, our future, my past, our present, still rests on your shoulders and you don't even break a sweat. So God, today I trust you with that which I cannot control. And I say, do your best work in this place and beyond. In Jesus' name. Come on, all God's people said amen. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you fighting the traffic, making the drive. I think it took me about an hour to get here today. But would you say hi to a friend, a neighbor on the way back to your seat? Thanks so much for joining us for Pursuit Seattle. Seattle. 
The pursuit exists to glorify Jesus and in doing so bring people into an encounter with the presence of God. Here's what's coming up at Pursuit. Join us March 31st for Easter Sunday. We will be holding services at every campus in Snohomish at 8, 15, 9, 30, 11, and 12, 30, 9, 30, and 11 a.m. in Kirkland and 6 p.m. in Seattle. We'll be live streaming online at 9, 30 a.m. and 6 p.m. Invite a friend or a family member and we'll see you on Easter Sunday. Join us this coming Tuesday, March 26th for Pursuit Young Adults. There will be a time of connection, worship, and a word from our young adult pastor. For more information and to stay up to date on events, text YA to 33200. On April 14th, we will be having Baptism Sunday across all of our Pursuit campuses. People come from all over the nation and region to be part of these special days. If you're looking to take your next step with Christ, sign up by texting BAPTISM to 33200. If you're looking to get more involved at Pursuit, our team would love to connect with you. For info on places to serve here at Pursuit, text SERVE to 33200. To stay up to date on what's happening with Pursuit or events happening at your local campus, follow us on all of our social media platforms. Here at Pursuit, we believe in giving our first and best through tithes and offerings. We are grateful for the generosity of our community and would like to give you an opportunity to give today. When the band starts playing, it will indicate that you can come forward and place your tithes and offerings in the buckets at the front of the stage, or you can make a digital donation through our website or via text to give. Thank you for being part of what God is doing in our pursuit community. We hope you have a fantastic week. Hey, now's the time to give. Thank you so much for partnering with us. In giving, let's do this now. Here we go. Awesome. Hey, welcome to church. Glad to have you in the house of God uh, with us uh, this evening. As you know, uh, next uh, Sunday is Easter Sunday. I'm going to encourage you to uh, invite a friend, uh, help share the graphic on social media uh, during Easter season. Man, people are particularly sensitive uh, to the gospel and to a gospel invite. And sometimes folks who, you know, uh, would never be in church. Uh, their entire life or who would always say no to an invite for whatever reason because of culture and media and maybe just religious expectation. They're, they're more open during the Easter season uh, than they are normally and um, encourage you to uh, utilize your sphere of influence this week and invite a friend, a family member, a neighbor, a co-worker uh, to uh, experience the power and the presence of God here uh, at Pursuit Seattle. I just heard a testimony like maybe last uh, week or, or two weeks ago, a family that um, had been previously uh, atheist who, who got born again at our Easter crusade last year at Angel of the Winds Arena, still in church today, serving God. And, and I'm just like, <clears throat> always like, just like amazed at how much God is doing behind the scenes that we don't ever even get around to saying thanks for, you know, half the time we don't hear about it or the other half of the time we just forget, but, and God by his own spirit, by his own power is doing incredible things in our midst. And it's the greatest uh, privilege in the world just to play a small part, uh, in that. Hey, one thing uh, I wanted to put on your uh, radar, uh, April 7th, which is in two weeks from tonight, Pastor Daniel Brown's going to be bringing the word here in Seattle. It's going to be powerful. You don't want to miss it. Uh, DB's really got uh, uh, an incredible and a profound gift on his life. And, and he spoke here just 
oh man, a few weeks ago and uh, just tore the roof off. And I said, you got to do that more often. And so it's cool. His parents is going to be in town actually that day. They're going to be here in Seattle. And I said, man, you got to preach in front of mom and dad. Let's do that. So he will be here and uh, we're going to be excited for that. Uh, this evening, <clears throat> I want to share with you uh, out of the Gospel of Luke, and in doing so, look at chapter 19, which records uh, the story of the uh, triumphal entry, which is the traditional passage preached on Sundays like this, which is Palm Sunday. Uh, Palm Sunday commemorates the start of, of Holy Week, which is the most widely celebrated religious tradition in the world today. It's where the three major branches of Christianity, uh, Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox, all come together to celebrate and commemorate the final week of Christ's life. In Luke 19, it records uh, the triumphal entry where Jesus um, famously is riding on the back of a donkey in fulfillment of prophecy for the final time into Jerusalem as the people erupt in prophetic song from the book of Zechariah. Behold, your Savior rides on the back of a donkey into the holy city. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And around the world today, um, through the start of a holy week, churches and ministries and uh, organizations that are Christian in, in nature are, are, are following the last seven days of the life of Christ. From his triumphal entry to his betrayal by Judas to the prayer in the garden of Gethsemane to his arrest by the Roman government to his abuse at the hands of the Sadducees and the soldiers to his crucifixion which is happening on Good Friday and of course, his resurrection that happens on, on Sunday morning. And uh, although uh, I preached a different type of sermon this morning out of Luke 19, I wanted to share with you the story of the triumphal entry because I think it's powerful and, and poignant because of the day that we are in today, but, but also because it, it serves as a prophetic picture and insight into the way that God still works with humanity today. If you want to know how God is going to work in the future, the best way to check that is to look at his track record. <clears throat> because the God who has done it before will do it again. Now, he doesn't always do it the same way, but God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when we use that theological word immutable, what that means is that God never changes. And in a world that constantly changes, it is of great confidence to the believer today that we have the God who changes not. <laughs> You know, in, in the Mormon uh, faith, which is not uh, Christian, they believe in an open canon. And every so often, the quorum of the 12 apostles who meet in Salt Lake City will determine that the Bible really should say this, but it didn't say that. But we've got to change our theology. And, you know, black people aren't allowed to serve as priests in the temple. Well, it's the 80s. We better change that. I think they are now because we had a new revelation. In a lot of the other major world religions, there's no guarantee of salvation or, or eternal security. And in the Islamic tradition and, 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 and faith, you never really know whether or not your life will be accepted by Allah until you die here below and stand before him there above. It, it's only in the Christian tradition that you can have absolute security in your relationship with Christ, knowing he's forgiven my sin, he's prepared a mansion for me in heavenly places, and there will come a day where to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, meaning there will be a moment in your life where you close your eyes for the last time here, and the next time you open them, you're in the presence of the King. And Holy Week serves as this kind of global reminder that what God did through his one and only son Jesus 2,000 years ago wasn't just a moment in history, it was the moment that split history. And even our secular historians and sociologists and those who study culture recognize that even in the way that we date the world calendar, you have time which is BC before Christ and you have time which is AD, which is after death. <laughs> When Jesus bled and, and died on the cross, it wasn't just the dawn of a new covenant. It was the dawn of a new age. 
by which now all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That God would receive as his inheritance people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And what we celebrate this week serves as a reminder that in the fullness of time, God sent his one and only son born under the law to redeem those who are under the law. That while we were yet sinners, Christ in fact died for us, took our place on the cross, became our propitiatory atonement, the ransom for our sin. He took my place, my death, paid my debt, wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against me, removed my sin as far as the east is from the west, put his indwelt spirit in my life, justified me, which means legally declared me to be righteous, and then inducted me into the process of sanctification by which I look more and more like him every day. That is the goodness of God in your life. And Luke 19 tells us the story of a rather emotional seven days, not just for Jesus, but for his followers. And in fact, the entire known world that had gathered in Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. And as Jesus rides into Jerusalem for the final time on on the back of a donkey, the crowds cannot be more elated. They're excited, they're cheering, they're yelling. It's like the biggest hype rally that you've ever seen. Finally, the king has arrived to save us. But of course, they wanted salvation from the Romans more than they wanted salvation from their sins. And when they found out that the kingdom that Christ came to bring was a spiritual kingdom first before it would be an earthly kingdom later, they went from shouting his praise to saying, give us Barabbas and let this man die. (laughs) And I think it's maybe particularly normal from an anthropological perspective that when we read the narrative of the holy text, we identify more with the hero than we do the villain. But the reality is, is how many times have you and I been that person in the crowd so excited because we think Jesus is going to deliver us from whatever problem or circumstance we find ourselves in only to recognize that what Jesus is most interested in is delivering us from us delivering us from the grips of sin, delivering us from our own selfishness, delivering us from our own propensity to sin, delivering us from our own proclivity to backslide. And we're like, well, God, I thought you was going to get rid of my problem. And God is like, I'm trying, but the problem is you. And watch what happens in, in Luke 19, which records the story of the triumphal entry, but it starts off with Jesus sharing a a, a parable in Luke 19, starting in verse 28, it says this. Now, when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. This would be his final trip into the holy city of Jerusalem prior to his crucifixion and his resurrection. Now, when I say it was his final trip, I mean, it was his final trip in this season. Because the Bible is clear that there will come a day where the clouds roll back like a scroll. And with the blast of a trumpet and a great shout from heaven, Christ will descend. And he will land on the Mount of Olives. And that mountain will split in two. And he will walk down through the Kidron Valley to the eastern gate. And that gate will open wide and it will fulfill the prayer of the prophets. Swing wide, you ancient gates, and open up, you heavenly doors, and let the king of glory in. And from that moment forward, Jerusalem's gates will be open, never to be closed again. And Jesus will be the light of that city and he will rule and reign from a seat of both spiritual and political power as the earth comes into a thousand year rule of Christ's ordained peace. But when he returns to Jerusalem for the final time, it won't be on the back of a peace donkey. It'll be on the back of a war horse as he comes to judge and avenge and defend his people. Luke 19, when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. Well, what things is Luke referencing? And those things are one of his famous and last parables he will tell 
before Holy Week begins. In verse 12 of Luke 19, it says, Therefore he said, A certain noble man went to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Remember, Jesus uses the power of storytelling to associate with analogies that other people can understand. That if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, actually reveal truth about the king and his kingdom. These parables are about the way the king and the kingdom operate. Therefore, he said, a certain noble man went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and a return. So he called 10 of his servants and he delivered to them three months wages. And he said to them, do business till I return. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first saying, Master, your mina has earned 10 more. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you were faithful in very little, have authority over 10 cities. Now hear me, friend. This parable tells me three primary truths. Number one, God is interested in a return on his investment. Number two, the master is returning soon. Number three, he desires to give his people authority over cities. He didn't give them a city to start with. He just gave them three months wages. And that's nice, but that's just like a pretty common severance. And when he returned to the one who had invested his three months wages and made a return, the master said to him, you was faithful with a little. Now let me give you a lot. The servant is probably thinking, man, what am I going to get now? Six months wages, 12 months wages. And the master says to him, here's 10 cities for you to oversee. Hmm. Which means this, when the Lord upgrades you, he does it exponentially. He didn't give like a cost of living increase. I gave you three months last time. Let's try four months this time. He said, I tested you with the temporal. Now let me give you the eternal. I trusted you with the common. Now let me give you the sacred. I trusted you with the financial. Now let me give you the social, the political, and the spiritual. I always had it in my heart to give you 10 cities, but I had to start with three months wages. And I think the problem in our world today is that we have our eyes set so much on that which God could or would or desire to give us on the other side of our faithfulness to the process that we want to hit fast forward on the journey to get where we are going so we can reap the reward overnight. Not understanding that it is the process of faithfulness with things that don't seem significant that so prepare your heart to deal with the stuff that is significant. Well, God, I just know I've got a calling on my life to do X, Y, and Z. I'm not saying that that ain't true. But the process to greatness takes you through the valley of the ordinary. And unless you have a grace, an honor, a fear, a reverence, and a respect for the ordinary, you won't ever get to the greatness that you've seen in your mind's eyes. We live in an entire generation that wants to skip the process because they become so consumed with how greatness will look, how it will bolster their resume, how it will appear on social media. So we got a bunch of people living fake lives, posting fake stuff so that they can have fake friends to get a fake impression of their fake reality. But if you were just to be faithful with stuff that other people don't care about, God would trust you with the stuff people really do care about. If you would just be faithful 
to be a doorman in the house of God, like David said, then God could trust you with the things that he has planted as dreams and desires in your heart. You know, the reason why the Lord plans dreams and desires in your heart is not so that he can snap his fingers and magically impart that to you in a moment at the altar, but instead so that he can invite you on a journey of development by which you keep your feet on a straight and narrow, your eyes set on that which is in front of you so that you can prove that you have walked worthy of the upward call of God, which is in Christ Jesus, setting your hand to the plow, not looking back so that when you get where you're going, you are the fully developed version of who God needs you to be. Well, God, I know that you've promised me X, Y, and Z. And it's like, yeah, but I'm trusting you right now with A, B, and C. Well, I know, but, but A, B, and C only gets me seven likes on Instagram, but nobody cares about A, B, and C. And the Lord goes, yeah, but I do, but I do because I'm actually caring more about your heart than the existential dream in your life. <laughs> it's not that I don't want to give you the plan and the purpose and the brilliance and the beauty and that which you so desire, but until God really can wrestle with the affection of your heart until his voice and his nearness becomes the only thing that you need, then even when you get where you're going, it won't be enough. And the Lord says, now I'm going to trust you with 10 cities. Watch, watch, watch. Because you were faithful in very little, now be faithful with very much. Because you were faithful in Snohomish, now have authority in Seattle. Because you were faithful with that ordinary job, now a promotion is opening up. Because you were faithful with that small task, now prepare for greater responsibility. Because you were faithful to grow what was given you, God will give you more. Faithfulness with the little is always the key that unlocks the door to authority over the many. And it is absolutely key that Jesus is telling this parable on this day just prior to his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He is telling his disciples, I am going to the Father on your behalf and I will give you authority in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even the uttermost parts of the earth and you will be my witnesses. But you gotta stay faithful to the process. Watch Matthew 24 and 13, but he who remains faithful to the end will be saved. Revelation 2 and 10, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. James 1 and 2, the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Hebrews 11 and 16, for without faith it's impossible to please God. Jude 1 and 3, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. 2 Timothy 4 and 7, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Hebrews 10 and 38, but my righteous ones shall live by faith. Romans 14 and 23, whatever is not from faith is sin. See, David was faithful with his father's flocks before God would give him authority over his father's people. Abraham was faithful with his one son before God would make him the father of many nations. Joseph is faithful as a servant until God makes him a ruler over Egypt. Samuel is faithful as a prophet under Eli until God makes him a prophet over Israel. For faithfulness with a current assignment is what unlocks favor for your next assignment. Watch the command in verse 13. Do business until I return. It didn't say hunker down in your fallout shelter until I return. It didn't say occupy a seat in a church that you don't really belong to, but you show up at every once in a while until I return. The master said, do business. To me, that looks like planting vineyards, building houses, raising families, reaching nations, impacting culture, influencing government, developing giftedness. Do business until I return. See, Jesus, the son of David, is entering the city of David, announcing that he would sit on the throne of David, and in doing so, fulfill every prophecy that was foretold about the Messiah who was and is and is to come. Even Jesus is connecting his messianic claim to the faithfulness of those who have come before him. And Jesus lives a faithful yet ordinary life from the moment he is born until the age
age of 30. The only thing that we know about Jesus in the first 30 years of his life is that at one moment in time, he gets left behind in the temple at the age of 12, relatively insignificant, feeling like his clock is ticking. My timeline is running out. If I haven't popped now, I don't know if I ever will. I think I'm too far behind a curve. Everybody else is excelling except me. My biological clock is running out of time. I wonder if God will ever do it for me. Everybody else seems to be doing an overnight success. And the most significant thing that I have on my resume is I got left at church once by accident when I was 12. And at the age of 30, he shows up at an ordinary wedding in an ordinary city. And an extraordinary God shows up in power. And what begins is a three and a half journey of unprecedented miracles that change the face of the earth. Because there was a man who was faithful to the ordinary. Now watch. And it came to pass when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, which I have stood on that he sent two of his disciples. Watch this. He said, go into the village opposite you, where as you enter, you will find a colt or a donkey tied up on which no man has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. Hmm. A donkey that ain't no one has ever sat on before. And this moment was so sacred, it was so holy, it was so reverent that it needed to be an animal that had never been saddled, never been ridden, never been yoked, branded, owned, or occupied by any other person before. Hear me, friend. We see this as a pattern in Scripture. Remember when the ark returned to Israel, it was put on a cart and pulled by two cattle that had never been yoked? When an atoning sacrifice was made in Israel, it was to be a red heifer that had never been yoked. There are some things that are so holy that God is unwilling to share them with any other entity. And in many ways, this is a picture of the gospel. God is unwilling to share you with any other writer, any other idol, any other identity, philosophy, worldview, or way of living. For when Christ sits on the throne of a person's heart, he isn't just showing up. He's taking over. See, friend, your life is, is not your own. You was, you was bought with a price. Now, you don't have the right to delete stuff from Scripture that you don't like. Your life is not your own. You don't have the right to make up your own identity or gender. Why? Because your life is not your own. You have given up the right to hate your enemies. You've given up the right to be selfish with your resources. You've given up the right to not forgive. Why? Because your life is not your own. <laughs> See, this was also the fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy in Zechariah 9 and 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey. It is so crazy that the people who are celebrating Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem are intimately familiar with the prophets who have declared that this day is coming. They see it. It makes sense in their mind. Yep, there he is, the Messiah. He's on a donkey. That checks out. He's showing up. He's lowly. He's humble. He's getting ready to disrupt the entire created order in this finite moment. They are connecting that this activity is the fulfillment of that which has been prophesied in times past. Yet even though it is the fulfillment of that which is written, because the net effect of it looks different than their preconceived idea and or notion. They go from being the biggest supporter and promoter of this Messiah to the loudest voices calling for his execution. And can I tell you, <clears throat> when God does something in your life, it will never be outside of his revealed character throughout scripture but he is not somehow bound 
to operate or do it in the same exact way that he did it in a previous season. And I think for us, this actually becomes the biggest barrier to revival. We pray for it, God does it, and then it looks different than the one that we saw on TV. And so we curse the thing before it ever gets out of the cradle to live. And then we're like, God, why don't you send revival? And he's like, I tried 14 times. But all you did was argue about the songs. All you did was complain about the seeds. All you did was get distracted about the carpet. All you did was be offended about what the pastor wore when he preached. All you did was send a complaint email because he wore a hat while he preached from the scripture. Like, like God did it. He did what you were praying for. He did what was prophesied. But because it looked different than the idol that you had built in your own mind, which is a violation of the Ten Commandments, build no graven image unto him, because it looked different than the idol that you set up, you killed it before it had a chance to breathe. It was like all these people praying for a revival and the Jesus people movement shows up and all of a sudden these long haired hippies with no shoes, smoking pot, walk into the church and they're like, hey man, we think we want to meet Jesus. And you had all these old timers who was like, nah man, you better cut your hair and you better wear the normal clothes. You better get shoes on your feet. You better wear a suit and tie and you better show up right the next Sunday. And so all these hippies said, we ain't showing up any way different than how we're showing up now. So they started their entire own denomination. That's where Vineyard comes from. That's where Calvary Chapel comes from. It was a bunch of hippies who just said, what we want is Jesus. What we don't want is religion. And all of the guys who have been praying for revival end up missing out on it because it came packaged in long haired, lawny frisbees instead of suit and tie individuals. And maybe just maybe God is interested in doing something that is exactly in line with his character, but exactly out of line with your expectation of how he should do it. And, and by the way, this is why revival always necessitates offense, <laughs> because offense reveals the true thing that sits upon the throne of your heart. <laughs> and revival always necessitates offense. You don't get oil without controversy. It always creates this interior conversation by which you have to wrestle with God to determine that if he shows up and shows himself strong, even if it looks different than what you thought, will you celebrate it or will you kill it? And just like the crowds who cheer for Barabbas, it's like churches who cheer for religion while revival knocks on their doorposts. Give us what we're used to. This presence, this man, this spirit, this power. You can't control it. <laughs> we, we said we wanted revival, but what we really wanted was momentum that we can control. So give us Barabbas, because at least we're familiar with him. And when God shows up, he says, it's my way and it's my kingdom and it's my prerogative and it's my power and you can get right or you'll be left. But when God shows up, it is shake the doorposts of your comfort until his smoke fills the temple of your heart. The king rides in on the back of a humble, ordinary donkey, and his presence still rides in on the back of humble, ordinary people today. <laughs> the donkey was a resource that had been waiting at a neighbor's house until it was time for every prophetic promise to be completed. The donkey did not materialize in the neighboring village when the disciples showed up. God has already figured out your transportation. God has already figured out how you will get from point A to point B. He's already figured out how that situation is going to turn for the better, how that issue is going to be resolved, how that promise is going to be fulfilled, how that family is going to turn around. God has already lined up the resource. Your job is to be obedient. Go to the neighboring village. You're going to find a donkey nobody's ever ridden before. That's the one that I want. Okay, could you give us some more instruction here? Because I've been to Israel and every little village got more donkeys than people. What do you mean? Find a donkey. Oh, you'll know when you see it. What do you mean just borrow it without asking so you can ride on it into the city? Oh, you, you'll know what it is when you see it. <laughs> 
I kind of feel that way about awakening. I don't know if I can define it, but I know when I see it. And God has already figured out the necessary transportation in your life, in this church, in this city, in your family, in this region to take us from where we are to where we need to be. We just have to have the courage and the faith to trust him in the process. See, we want God to draw us a treasure map like the pirates of old and X marks the spot and here's the exact coordinates and this is exactly what it's gonna look like and the donkey's gonna have one wonky ear and that's how you're gonna know and it's gonna be at this house with this address and this is gonna be the owner and this is his name and, and Jesus just says, go, just go, just do it, just show up and when you show up, I'm gonna show up and when I show up, you ain't gonna need no explanation because everybody's gonna know that I showed up and if you'll just trust me to go. I'll loose a resource that will be instrumental in your transportation. Now watch, watch in verse 31. And if anyone asks you why you are loosing it, thus you shall say to him, watch, I love this, because the Lord has need. So those who were sent went their way and they, they found it just as he had said to them. And they brought him to Jesus and, and, and they threw their own clothes on the colt and they sat Jesus on him. See, Jesus could have done this miracle in any way that he so saw fit. But for whatever reason, hear me, friend, it required the participation of a willing neighbor and a willing disciple who would help unlock a resource that had never been utilized before. Why won't God just perform the miracle without my participation? Because the Lord desires your involvement. Because in creation, God gave dominion to man. Because Psalms 115 says the highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to man. See, you have a certain mandate and authority in the natural realm. And when you partner your natural with his supernatural, that is most often when the miracle is produced. Well, God, I've just been praying for this thing for a long time. I'm wondering when you're going to overnight Amazon prime it to my doorstep with a bow on it. Never, never, never. <laughs> You know, we pray for resource and, and, and we expect Jesus to operate like a leprechaun with a pot of gold. Just drop it on my doorstep when I wake up in the morning. See, you're praying for resource so God gives you an application to get a job. You're praying for a resource so God introduces you to a season of development by which your acumen and your skill set can be sharpened. You're praying for a relationship. God introduces you to a season of development so that you can fix what is wrong with you so you don't pass that on to the life of, of somebody else. We pray for miracles and God introduces us to processes. And the process will result in the miracle. But the reason why there is a process attached to it is because in the process is where you ingratiate yourself in relationship to him. <laughs> you find he is the God who walks with me and talks with me and calls me by name and calls me his own. I can depend on him. I can trust him. I can process with him. I can believe in him. I can have faith in him. I can know that he's asleep in my boat in every storm that I face. I have learned to trust this God in the process of my development. You know, uh, my wife, Marie, and I, we have uh, three kids now, a nine-year-old, a five-year-old, and a, 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 a three-year-old. And, and, and the nine-year-old and the five-year-old are, are now just getting into, like they've, they've figured out, they have figured out the hustle. Like if they want money, they're going to have to do something around the house in order to get it. And I, I pay my children like worse than like a North Korean slave labor camp, you know? I'll be like, thank you for vacuuming all day, Matthew. Here's 38 cents. Uh, and he always tells me the same thing. He goes, can I go to Fred Meyer and buy something? And I'm like, uh-huh, yes, you can. You could buy one stick of gum with that 38 cents. And the reality is, is that I have enough resource just to 
give to them freely without expecting them to engage in the process at all. But I know that as a good father, I have to be more concerned with the development of their soul than just the outcome of what their specific need is in that moment. And so you know what I find myself doing as a father? Creating chores that don't even exist to give them an opportunity to learn the value of engaging in the process. I told my boy the other day, I said, I'm going to give you 10 cents for every dandelion you get out in the yard. Now, I was expecting that he would go and he'd pull up the dandelion. He just pulled the heads off the dandelions. (laughs) He brought them all in. Dad, I got 40 of them. And I said, okay, I got to clarify next time what I'm expecting. But, you know, here's $4. Thanks for your contribution. But the father withholds no good thing from those whom he loves. But his good things are attached to the development of your soul that so that you become a protege, not a parasite, so that you become a protege, not a prodigal, so that you never get to a place in your relationship with him where you say, you're dead to me. Just give me the inheritance that is owed to me. I can do this without you. No, God engages us in the process of developmental faith because it is in those seasons of process and development where our hearts are enmeshed with his. See, I'm convinced when you tithe, it produces a resource miracle in your immediate future. I'm convinced when you lay hands on and pray, it transfers the power and anointing of God into a person's life. I'm convinced when you prophesy, it's a word being released with creative power to shift the unseen realm. I'm convinced that when you worship, it's a song of deliverance that declares to your circumstance that breakthrough is coming. But in each of those circumstances, there is a human responsibility and a God-shaped responsibility. If I will engage in acts of obedience below, God will engage in acts of power above. See, the donkey didn't have a saddle. So the disciples took their clothes and placed it on the donkey's back. Watch, making a seat for the master to ride in on. It doesn't need to be pretty or perfect in order for God to use it. It just needs to be available and offered. If it is true that the Lord enthrones himself on the praises of his people, then that means when I cast off the garment of heaviness and in exchange I receive the garment of praise, my old garment becomes a new seat for him to sit on, to ride in on my obedience to whatever sphere of influence that I occupy at that moment. They're taking off their old clothes. It's been tattered on the journey. It's been a long time. We've been walking with Jesus all over Galilee and Jerusalem and Judea. And this is a little dusty. And I'd probably give this to Value Village. And this don't even look pretty. But I will offer God what I have. And in doing so, it will become a seat for the master to be enthroned on. I'm convinced that a lot of times what keeps Christians from engaging in worship is they feel like their song is not worthy of enough for God to enthrone himself on. Meaning this, well, I've had a tough week and I've had a messed up life and I've been struggling with some things and I've been facing some challenges and I'm not perfect myself and I don't know if I can do this. And sometimes I believe and other times I don't believe. And I feel like I'm still struggling with some things and I still got bondage that's broken off in my life. So until it's perfect, I won't offer God what I have because I'm not sure I'll accept it. But the Bible says that the sacrifice that he always accepts is a broken and a contrite both heart and spirit. So if that is an acceptable sacrifice unto God, then my broken song, my contrite worship is a good enough seat for him to sit on and in doing so ride into whatever sphere of influence I find myself in. Whether you like it or not, you have a part to play. Your participation matters because God is looking for willing partners in the earth. And I love what Jesus says. (laughs) Number one, I I love the way that he interacts with his disciples because he always says these kind of like mystical, esoteric statements and then never explains it. And then just expects his disciples to do it, you know? Like go into the city, steal a donkey. If anybody stops you, just tell them the master's in need of it. Like, which master? Who? 
Can we give them some more context? What will it look like when we arrive? How will it sound? Will it be a big donkey, a small donkey, a medium donkey? Help us help you by giving us more information about the days that are ahead. And is not that the greatest struggle with the human experience? We think that what keeps our trust held back from God is lack of information. God, if I just had more information about what this next season of life looked like, I could just trust you more. Yet the Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. Faith is a decision you make when you don't have the information available. If you have all the information available, it doesn't require faith. <laughs> And so Jesus, knowing the anxiety of their heart, says, and if anybody asks you, tell them the master is in need. <laughs> it's hard for me sometimes, Adam, to picture Jesus being in, in need of anything. No, 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 no. He, he is part of the triune Godhead. One God made manifest in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. When there was nothing by their spoken voice, they created everything. When darkness covered the earth, the Spirit of God brooded over the darkness. When God said, let there be light, there wasn't a debate. The lights just turned on. It's hard for me to imagine that this God is in need of anything. And yet this word is, is used intentionally. Tell them the the master needs it. Watch, watch. St. Augustine said it like this. Without God, we cannot. But without God, without us, God will not. Without God, we cannot. But without us, God will not. When, when I say God is in need of something, what I don't mean is that God is needy. What I mean is that God has bound himself in covenantal relationship to those who are made in his image. And he is looking for partners in the earth to pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I no longer call you servants, I call you friends because friends know the master's business. God is in need of partners in the earth. And Jesus tells his disciples, do not say four months and then the harvest lift up your eyes for the fields are ripe under harvest and pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would thrust out laborers into his harvest field. Why? Because Jesus was in need. And maybe whether you like it or not, or can even conceptualize it in its entirety tonight, your participation with the divine unlocks doors of obedience that otherwise would not be unlocked without a yes in your heart to the word and to the ways of the Lord. Meaning this, there are people who wait on the other side of my yes. Huh. There's a city that waits on the other side of our yes. There's a region that waits on the other side of our yes. And when we walk in our obedience, it unlocks the hearts of others to walk in their obedience. I would say it like this. God is in need of a spirit-filled church in Seattle. God is in need of a spirit-filled witness in your family system. God is in need of a young man or a young woman to view themselves as a missionary when they walk on the university campus. God is in need of you having a yes in your heart that carves the very course of history. And then I love what he says. He says, find a donkey that is tied up. And he says, and, and loose him and let him go. It, it, it actually reminds me very similarly of the conversation that Jesus has after Lazarus gets up out of the grave. And he gets out of the grave, but he is still bound by the grave clothes. And so he speaks to the sisters of Lazarus, Mary and Martha, loose him and let him go. And I think sometimes what we do is we make ourselves available, but we're not willing to deal with the bondage that has us tied up. So the flesh is weak, even 
even though the spirit is willing. I've got a yes in my heart, but I've got a no in my flesh. I want to raise my hands and worship, but I want to return to my bondage as soon as I get out of this service. I know what I need to do in my heart. I just don't have the strength to pull my flesh in line. And so we find ourselves as that unbridled donkey that never sat upon animal, that unyoked thing that God is looking to partner with for the redemption of tribes, tongues, and nations. But for some of us, we are still so bound up in the grave clothes of our last season that even though we're walking, we're still like dead men on the inside. Now watch, watch, watch. And as he went, as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was now drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Very similar to what the angels declared to the shepherds who are watching their flock by night. <laughs> because when the presence of God shows up in a powerful way, everybody's got the same declaration. Holy, glory, power, peace. It just emanates from who he is. But what I find it interesting is that the crowd so easy join in worship of the one that they have not followed or pledged their allegiance to for the last three and a half years. Can I tell you, in a worship environment, it's easy to catch the vibe. It's harder to catch the spirit. So, oh man, dude, this band is tight. This sounds good, man. It's awesome. I'm kind of vibing with this thing. It's like, no, bro, we're singing the words of scripture. <laughs> We're singing our fidelity to Christ. We are confessing the creeds of the historic church. We're just doing it with a click track, drums, and electric guitar. Like these are not like empty words. This is not like Christian karaoke. This is not like feel the vibe. This is not like what you used to tell your parents when you were listening to like rap and hip hop that you knew wasn't good. I don't listen to the words. I just like the beat. <laughs> I feel like we got a whole generation that don't listen to the words. They just like the, the beat. And so they'll just kind of show up and they'll bop back and forth and worship, but they ain't really listening listening to the words or the power of the declaration of their tongue for the power of life and death is where it is in your mouth. And I'm telling you, when it comes to worship, I'm not just bopping because it's four on the floor and we're hitting the drums and it sounds good and we're driving. I am confessing the good confession of faith. I'm declaring I belong to Jesus and he is in need of me. <laughs> And as he's drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the city and its people are drawing near to him. For if we would draw near to God, he would, would draw near unto us. Now watch, watch. To reach Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, Jesus would proceed west down the mountain. He would walk through the, the Kidron Valley and into the temple area through the Eastern Gate. Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey representing peace. See, Palm Sunday gets its name from the branches of the palm trees that would have laid down on the road. Watch, as an act of honor as Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Nothing in the scripture is there by accident. When Christ returns, he will walk the same exact path, declaring the same exact thing. I am the king returning for my kingdom, and I will have my glory on the earth. This is inter interesting. Watch. This was commonly done in the Roman Empire. When a king and his army would conquer a city, the king would ride triumphantly through the streets as the people would lay down their coats on the ground as a sign of honor, submission, loyalty, and reverence. No wonder the Romans were so threatened by Jesus. No wonder the religious establishment was so irritated by this Jesus. He wasn't just a good teacher. He wasn't just a worker of miracles. He wasn't just a student of the law. He wasn't just another spiritual leader. He was the promised Messiah. And on this day, the crowds would announce the king that we've been waiting for is finally here. Interesting, watch this. In ancient Egyptian religion, 
the palm branch was carried in funeral processions and it represented eternal life. In the Jewish tradition, the palm branch was carried during the Feast of Tabernacles to celebrate provision. Think about the significance of what is happening in this moment. You have Jews and Gentiles, both who have recognized the importance of what Jesus is doing in this very act, and they are laying down their symbols of triumph, victory, provision, and eternity at the feet of Jesus. <laughs> For thousands of years, Hundreds of different cultures used symbols to express the deep felt need and desire for victory, eternity, and triumph. And yet in one fateful moment, Jesus walks through Jerusalem and announces, I am the one you have always desired and I have come to bring significance to your symbols. Think about this. The Bible says God's planted eternity in people's hearts. And when people don't know God, they'll turn to palm branches to represent the eternity that they have a need for, but they don't know how to express. And when Jesus rides into Jerusalem, it's like this is the moment where all the dreams and fears of all the years are colliding in this fateful moment as Jews and Gentiles are bringing the symbols of their victory and the symbols of their eternity and the symbols of their honor and their reverence and their power and their authority and they're laying it at his feet and they're saying, Jesus, ride in on the highway of our imagery because in this moment, the shadows that we have attached to are being fulfilled by the picture that is Christ. Huh. It wasn't just like, oh, we got a palm tree. Let's, let's cut some branches down and I'll put it on the ground. That'd be cool. <laughs> this is what the Roman emperors did when they invaded cities. And the people are saying, come invade Jerusalem and do what only you can do. Watch, I'm almost done. The people laid their coats on the ground and they waved palm trees in their hands. They declared, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now watch, verse 39, watch. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd and they said, teacher, rebuke your disciples. <laughs> he answered and said to them, watch, watch, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would cry out. The more I read this verse, the less that I think it's hyperbole. The more I be read this verse, the less that I think it's an analogy. No, 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 no. I actually think all of creation has been longing for this very moment and now it is finally here. The one who they had waited for, believed for, contended for, the one who through him all things were made, the one who was born of a virgin, both fully God and fully man, the one who would take away the sin of the world and offer redemption to all who believe, the one who the entire earth groaned waiting for his revelation, he was finally here and someone, something, someone had to give him praise lest the very stones that were created in the beginning would have become animated by faith and cried out themselves. This also functions as an indictment on the Pharisees. Jesus is saying even the rocks who cannot see and cannot hear recognize that the Messiah is walking by. And yet those who search the scripture still manage to miss the Messiah who is standing right in front of them. Get this. In Daniel 9, Daniel prophesied that 483 years from the day of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, 483 years to that day, Daniel prophesied, 
the Messiah would ride triumphantly into Jerusalem in 483 years to the day. In Luke 19, Jesus rides in on a donkey and fulfills God's promise. As he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city watch and he wept. And there's only two times in all of the Gospels where it records that Jesus ever weeps. One is when Mary and Martha are upset and sad that Lazarus has passed away. They say, if only you were here, he would have lived. And the Bible says that Jesus wept. The second time that it mentions that Jesus weeps is in verse 41. As he approaches Jerusalem on the donkey and he overlooks the holy city, he is moved by the great emotion and heart of the Father. And Jesus says this, watch, watch. If you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes because you did not know the time of your visitation. In Luke 19, the recording of the triumphal entry, Jesus goes from kind of an esoteric, mystical command to his disciples to go find a donkey, loose him, and bring him over here to riding into the city as the people erupt in jubilee and praise, singing the words of the prophet Zechariah, blessed is he who comes in, in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest peace on earth to all men. And can you imagine as the crowds begin to swell and as people begin to cheer and chant and worship and song and dance, and as the crowds are at a fever pitch, Jesus pulls the donkey off to the side of the road and he looks over the holy city and in the midst of the eruption of the crowd's elation, he begins to weep because there's a city that has missed out on the, on the day of its visitation. And, and, and can I tell you, like, for you and for me as believers who are contending for revival and awakening in the Northwest, we have to develop the ability to hold both of those truths at the same time. The ability to have existential, unbridled joy in the presence of God. And at the same time, have our heart break for a city that is missing the day of its visitation. Huh. And that can be a difficult ecosystem to manage at times because it's much easier to find the emotion that we're comfortable with and then park there for the rest of our lives. For some people, it's like, I got to stay up and I got to stay in that kind of high vibration and it's just the joy and the good vibes and the fun and the celebration. And other people are more drawn to the depressive and, and the dark and they're just the weeping prophet all the time and everything is bad and the sky is always falling and the city is missing out and the lost are going to hell and what are we going to do? And what I love about Luke 19 is that Jesus models not an either or, but a both and. He models the celebration of a day that has been prophesied in eternity's past that is being fulfilled now right in his midst, but at the same time he is weeping over a city because he knows that there is so much more. And on nights like this in Seattle I find my heart oftentimes torn in two directions, celebrating what the Lord has done, and yet in my heart grieving because there are so many that have yet to meet this Jesus. And, 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 and this is <laughs> and I, I think this is why oftentimes the pursuit of revival ends up like burning people out in their minds. It ends up frying their gears because they're like, it is hard for me to live in the dissonance and the bifurcation and the juxtaposition between these two realities. It would just be easier for God to pick whatever frequency I need to operate at and leave me there. <laughs> but can I tell you, like a father who... <clears throat> 
operates with great care or concern for children like Paul who labored like a woman giving birth until Christ was formed in the churches that he planted and oversaw. We operate as fathers and mothers in a city who are rejoicing because God has done great things and contending and weeping because there is yet still so much more to do. And I think that if we can continue to hold those two truths at the same time, that what it creates in our life is a bold, audacious courage married to a brokenness and a contriteness that keeps us humble, that causes us to have the right perspective intention of that which God desires to do. And if we can hold those truths as a community, then we can learn the lesson of the triumphal entry. A God who rides in on the back of his people's obedience, whose heart still breaks over the condition of a city, who sets his face as a flint toward Zion and refuses to be moved, knowing the cost that lays ahead for him but despising the shame of the world, enduring that which is ahead with great joy, and in doing so, receiving the reward of the highest name. And this is our call and, and our mission that like Christ, we would identify with the fellowship of his suffering and the power of his resurrection and that together, we would hold these truths in our heart with eyes focused on Jesus missional in our outreach, <clears throat> overjoyed in our worship, intense and focused on the topic of revival, but also understanding that God's heart is that none should perish, but that all should come into eternal life. And I don't know about you, but like I vacillate between like being angry at the way that Seattle is and also like having my heart broken by the way that Seattle is. And like <clears throat> that anger, if it's contained, it, it'll motivate righteous action. And that brokenness, if it's contained, will motivate righteous intercession. But any of those things out of balance will cause you to be out of balance. And if we hold these things in, in, in tension, and if we hold these truths being self-evident in our, in our soul, I think God will continue to help us to steward what he desires to do and breathe upon on, on the dry bones of, of Seattle and beyond. And, and you and I have been tasked with this great opportunity and, and not in a weird way and not like in a God's not sovereign way, but, but God is in need of pursuit. He's in need of you. He's in need of me. He's in need of that university. He's in need of every seat of authority and power in this city. God's in need of it. Who are the ones who are brave enough to walk to a village they haven't been, to untie a donkey they've never met, to take off their coats and create a seat upon that which has not been yoked and invite Jesus to take his rightful place. May that be us in this place tonight. Come on, would you stand as we close? Let me pray for you tonight and encourage you in the Lord and in doing so, invite you tonight to <clears throat> receive prayer at this altar. Let me again just put it on your radar. I'm really going to encourage you this week. Invite somebody to church, man. Let them know about what God is doing. I think people need the hope of the gospel more in this season than they ever have before. <laughs> and uh, the church is still God's plan A. It's his answer to a dying and a hurting world. And I believe that not just this church, but you as an individual are a light set on a hill for all men to see. So let us so let our light shine in this season. And in doing so, invite people to the banqueting table of the Lamb. Father, I thank you not for my people, but for your people. I thank you for what you're doing in our midst tonight. I thank you that even through the preaching of the word, the singing of the word, the praying of the word, that whether people in this room are fully aware of it or not, you have done the business of breaking bondages tonight. Because where the anointing of God is, the yoke of bondage cannot exist. And God, I thank you tonight for the anointing of your spirit, the oil 
that comes from heaven, the wind that blows from the throne room, the fire that rests upon our heads, that fills this place. I thank you that even right now you are breaking the bondages of heaviness that have held people back or kept people disengaged from putting full faith, full trust, full fidelity in who you are. God, tonight, I pray that in these closing moments, uh, you would truly have 100% access to every room in our heart and that you would do the work that no man can see, but that every man most desperately needs, not by our own might nor by our own power, but in fact, by your spirit alone, that you would cause that which is dead to come alive, that which is hurt to come into wholeness, that which is missing to be found, that which is bound to be set free. God, tonight that you would do that type of work in us, but not just in us, but in a city that our heart breaks over because there are still so many people that have yet to encounter this type of God. God, I pray that you would blow wind in a supernatural way in what's happening here in this community, in what's happening here in Seattle on Sunday nights, that God, the message of freedom, hope, peace, tranquility, safety, salvation would spread spread across this city, that you would bring in the least, the lost, and the last to experience the hope, the power, and the freedom of the gospel message. God, I thank you that still today you are triumphantly riding into cities on the back of the praises of your people, and you are declaring this city will never be the same again. So God, tonight, in the same way you rode into Jerusalem on that donkey, may you ride in on the back of our obedience, on the back of our worship, on the back of our on triteness, on the back of our repentance, on the back of our humility, on the back of our brokenness, on the back of our song, on the back of our praise, on the back of our petition and intercession, that as we boldly approach the throne of grace in our time of need to receive help, that God, you would take that as a sign to ride in to every sphere of influence that we currently occupy, that the message of the king and his impending kingdom would be waved like a banner over this region until every eye sees and every ear hears. God, do that type of work in this type of city because if you did it for Jerusalem, you can do it for us. And may we be your people in this hour who don't require all of the information to be able to take those next steps of faith and obedience following hard after you. Oh, some trust in chariots and others in, in horses, but, but we, we, us, this people, we will trust in the name of the Lord. And God, we ask now for your help. For unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers build in vain. Unless the Lord watches the city, the watchmen, they, they watch in vain. And God, we want this to count for all of eternity, for you to receive the reward of your suffering souls from the harvest. And God, I pray that even as we go into Holy Week, as the sensitivities of the region are elevated, as people maybe for the first time or only time throughout the year are talking about God more in public spaces than they normally do. That God, you would use the curiosity, even like you partnered with the curiosity of Nicodemus to introduce him into the idea of being born again. Would you use the curiosity of the Easter season and Holy Week, which begins tonight, to draw many sons and daughters unto yourself, that they could truly experience the hope and freedom that is found in Jesus' name alone. God, I pray that you would do that type of work in this city, and I'm just foolish enough to believe that if you've done before. The God who is immutable and changes not, in fact, can do it again. But God, we're saying tonight, you've got full permission to do it your way. You've got permission to do it in whatever way that you so see fit. And God, I pray that you will bring people in by the droves to experience the freedom, the power, and the healing that comes from an encounter with your presence. God, do that type of work in Seattle. God, do that type of work on the UW. God, do that type of work at SPU. God, do that type of work in the community colleges that are represented in this region. God, do that type of work at Google and Amazon and Boeing. God, do that type of work in the major metroplexes and neighborhoods and bedroom communities around Seattle. God, do that type of work here. And may Sunday nights in Seattle truly function as an evangelistic outpost 
for the city. May it function as a lighthouse leading ships back to the safety of the harbor. May it serve as a prophetic witness to a city that has overdosed on inferior idols and gods, that it is time to come back home to the saving knowledge of Christ Jesus. God, I pray that this city would be absolutely transformed by an encounter with your glory and that this church would serve as a spearhead to swing wide ancient gates and open up heavenly doors, that Christ would become the light of Seattle for all men to see, that the grace that appeared to all men would appear in our gatherings, that he would appear in our cities, that the one who was lifted up high on the cross for all eyes to see would draw many prodigals unto himself, would draw the atheists and the agnostics and the hard-hearted and the Muslims and the Buddhists and those who are far from you. Oh God, I pray that your grace now would begin drawing, drawing, drawing from this city, plundering hell and populating heaven. God, I pray that you would do a work that no man could take credit for, that it would be so profound and powerful that nobody ever in their wildest dreams would think that it was because of our brilliance or our strategy. They would say this has to be because of a God who has supernaturally intervened on behalf of his people in their moment of need. And God, we confess tonight, we need you more than we have ever needed you before. We can't do this on our own. We're not smart enough, talented enough, qualified enough, anointed enough, gifted enough. I don't just want the anointed. I want the anointed one. I just don't want the gift. I want the gift giver. God, I want you more than anything else. I want your name to be lifted high as a banner. I want Jehovah Nisi, the banner of God, to be waved over this city. I want the God who heals, saves, and delivers, that his voice would thunder in the region of Seattle, that the ground would shake and the skies would part as the glory of God pours out in unprecedented fashion. Oh God, in this holy week, I pray that you would stir the holy curiosity of a city, that they would be drawn in by the peculiar affection of the people who gather on Sunday nights to call upon the name of the Lord. Oh God, draw them in, draw them in, draw them in, draw in the long-haired hippies of our generation, the LGBTQ movement. Draw them in to the saving knowledge of Christ Jesus. Draw in the drug addicts. Draw in the lost and the hurting and the abused and the homeless and the suicidal. God, bring them in. Invite them to the wedding banquet of the Lamb that they may be clothed in white, that they may dine at the table of the King, that their lives would be changed forever. Oh God, do that type of work in this type of hour, in this type of city. Oh God, do it for us like you've done it before. Oh God, do it again, do it again, do it again. And on Holy Week, we declare once again over Seattle, Seattle, give up your dead, give up your prodigal, give up your wounded, give up your sick, your diseased, your demonized, and your infirmed, because the King of Glory is here. Who is this King of Glory?
city, even like you said over Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets, <laughs> you who reject the words of, 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 of those who, who have come before us, <laughs> oh Jerusalem, I have desired to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you have rejected me. But yet still I cry out, oh, Jerusalem. Huh. And could we just for a moment this evening pray for and contend for a city that has killed the prophets, run out the pastors, killed off the churches? And could we still say in this moment, oh, Seattle, how I have desired to see you gather back in. How I have desired to see you come into your divine inheritance. How I have desired you to burn with a heart of revival and fervor for the things of the Lord. Come on, friend, let's just lift our voice this evening and let's just pray and, and believe that God would hear our cry, that he would turn his ear from heaven, that he would be attentive to the prayers that are offered in this place, and that the word of God, which never returns void, would accomplish everything everything that is being sent forth to do tonight. Oh God, we pray for cities in this region, in specific Seattle, that have rejected you, that have turned with hard hearts against you, that have mocked and rejected and killed and turned away from you as you have desired to gather them in. And we call Seattle back into right relationship with God tonight. We say, oh, Seattle, we still serve a God who desires to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks. We say, Seattle, it's time to come back home. We say, Seattle, it's time. It's time. It's time. It's time for the drought to end. It's time for salvation to spring up from the ground. It's time for God to rend the heavens and come down. It's time time. Isn't it time for revival again? Isn't it time for salvation again? Isn't it time for miracles again? Isn't it time for stadium events again? Isn't it time for the winds of awakening again? Isn't it time for the cloud the size of a man's hand to break out in the reins of awakening again? Oh, Seattle, it's time to be gathered. It's time to come home. It's time to get right with God. God, do it for us. Do it for the lost. Do it for 30,000 students on the college campus. Do it for Fred Row. Do it for our families. Do it for those who are far from you. Oh, God, tonight, do it in even greater measure. Open the floodgates of heaven.
right here. It's not just intercession. What we're doing is we're worshiping our way into warfare right now. We're declaring over the lost and over the broken that it is going to reign God's reign over their life. Those who have been lost are coming back home this week. Those who have been estranged from him are coming back home this week. I want you to lift up your voice in worship. Let it rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. God, let it rain. Open up your mouth and declare it. Open up your mouth and declare it.
right, listen, some of you might not know who I am, but I'm going to share my testimony. My name is Charles. I've been a part of this thing since we planted years and years ago. But I felt impressed on my heart to share actually how I came to know the Lord. Like you won't see any of this stuff on me because the Lord's redeemed me from everything. So I've been washed clean. So you don't see my past on me because he's given me a new name. He's given me new life. But I was a, I was a drug addict for years. I lived in a house. I lived in a flop house. And let me tell you, no one came to evangelize to me or nothing. Like the, the way that I came to know the Lord is I had two dreams. The first dream scared me sober for 24 hours and that was unheard of at that time. Like I'd be drinking, I'd be doing drugs, that would keep you up three, four nights a week. This dream that I had scared me sober for 24 hours and the only thing that I knew, and I didn't know the Lord or nothing at this time, the only thing that I did know is if I keep living this way, my life's gonna be chaos. That lasted 24 hours, then a day and a half later, I was back doing the same stuff I was always doing but the Lord was relentless in pursuing me. I know now it was the Lord at the time, I didn't know what it was. It was something that I couldn't shake. It was something I couldn't escape from. About a month and a half after I had that first dream, I had a, I had a second one. And that dream felt like I was awake in it. Like you could pinch me and it would feel real. Towards, towards the end of that dream, I remember I was hanging with these hooks in my arms and my back and I was looking at this red barren landscape look in it was there's two clear thoughts that I had in the anguish that I was in there was only two clear thoughts and it was I deserve to be here this is right and I didn't know what it was at the time but I knew that the Lord was showing me if I continued living the way I was living this was my eternal dwelling place and like I said I didn't have context or language or anything at the time but I ended up reaching out to a cousin who was a Christian and at the time if I'm honest I don't even know why I reached out to him but I know that my family had been praying for me and I found that out actually about a year and a half later they had been praying for me for those those years I was in drugs nearly every day and my grandma specifically was praying every day Lord speak to Charles would you speak to him God when we can't reach him would you send people that can reach him and so I'm saying that I'm saying that because the, the, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Now, hear me. No one came and spoke to me. The Lord spoke to me through a dream when no one could reach me. And so I want to say that there's no one too far gone that he can't reach. And he communicates. He communicates in ways that people understand. And so even as I'm saying this, you have a son, you have a daughter who is addicted to drugs right now. You have a parent who's addicted to drugs right now. And not only that, they've been involved in, the, in witchcraft as well. There's, I also feel like the Lord's even speaking to me right now that there's a couple of you in here who you're, 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 it's not just like a sibling, but there's siblings that have been involved in this uh, cyclical uh, 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 generational spiritual practice and the Lord's going to deliver you from it tonight. He's saying that you are the turning point, that you're the door and you're the catalyst for your family to come back into salvation. And so if that's you, I want you to come forward and come up to this altar. We're gonna have, we have prayer team members up here. We're going to pray for you. That curse breaks today. There's some of you that, like I said, they're, they're, you've been praying for people inside of your family, inside of your friend group. And even as I'm speaking right now, they're coming to your mind. If that's you and your heart's racing, come up forward and get prayer right now. The, the people at the altar are going to agree with you in prayer, but you're going to pray it out because you know them and there's authority when you voice out their, that person's name and start interceding for them. The band's going to kick back up. I'm going to pray and I want you to come forward and enter into this because we're in a window of opportunity, like I said, where the Lord is moving tangibly in people's lives. So Father, we bring ourselves humbly before you and we acknowledge that you are the one true living God, that you are the one who formed us and knit us and created us in our mother's womb. Lord, that you know the end from the beginning, God, that you are the Alpha and the Omega. We acknowledge you as the creator and ruler of all. So we ask God that you, as the ruler of all, God, as the master communicator, would you reach out to people who seem to be unreachable in our lives? God, those, those, those friends, those family members, Lord, we ask God that you would speak to them in a way that they understand that it's you. I thank you, God, that you're desire for them is greater than our desire. So we say, God, we partner with your desire in bringing them into your kingdom. Lord, would you send them dreams tonight, God? Would you lose dreams and visions of who you are to them, God? I declare your loving kindness is what leads people to repentance. So show them, Lord, on, uh, show them in your mercy what you're doing on behalf of their life. Right now, God, we call, uh, we, we call 
addictions broken tonight, God. God, we declare that the, the spirit of witchcraft that's entangled people's thoughts and perspective and minds, we declare that gone now in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for your blood that declares a better word over their life. So we speak the blood of Jesus over their hearts, over their minds, and over their life, God. That suicide will not be the last thing they have on their note, Lord. God, we declare the author and perfecter of our faith is here, and he's the author of life. So we declare the author of life writes the last note for them. God, we declare, we declare that in Jesus' name, that you are the one who sees us, that you are the one who knows us, Lord. So we ask, Father, now, would you move on their behalf, Jesus? Would you move on their behalf, God? 